Welcome to the second episode of Both Sides TV. I'm super excited today. Our guest has a career built in both product management and specifically in video, which has become the hottest area of the web. Today, my guest is Joe Perez from Tastemade. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for coming. Glad to be here. Yeah, so what I want to do is I want to get started with your background a little bit. Okay. So you uh, graduated in Southern California. Yes, I did. But are you from Southern California originally? I'm from Michigan originally. You're like, from Michigan. Yes. Okay, but you chose weather. Yes, I did. And uh, I noticed one of your early jobs was Excite at Home, and I'm guessing for a lot of millennials, Excite at Home means nothing. Exactly. To some of us, we'll remember that Google wasn't necessarily going to be Google. Talk about your days at Excite at Home. When were you there? What did you work on? What did you learn? Yeah, so it was back in 1997. So for all of, uh, some people may not remember there was a dot-com boom, the first dot-com boom. Yeah. It started with the browser in 1994 with Mark Andreessen coming over from, you know, with his Mosaic browser and, you know, coming over to create Netscape, which was amazing. So I, me and my buddies, we were in San Diego and said, there's nothing going on in San Diego for tech. Yeah. Let's move to San Francisco and just figure it out. And we basically to, just... To be fair, there was a small company called Qualcomm. Yeah, right? that, that was. I actually worked for Qualcomm. I, oh, was, did I, you I, as I, did, I interned uh, for the PR department, you know, for a PR firm that was, we were, Qualcomm gotcha. was our company. But it was really mostly focused on tracking trucks back then, literally. Because I went to the school down the street from you. I went to UCSD. UCSD, yeah. So. Yeah. So, uh, so we all moved up there and... Uh, Excited Home was actually my second company. I'll just the, the first company I worked for was a company called Total Entertainment Network. I had no idea what the company was, and then found out later that it was an online gaming company funded by Kleiner and a bunch of other people that I had no. I was you know totally green. I had no idea what the what the scene was out there. And was it console gaming? Was no. It, web it was gaming? we were we were the first we were Browser? one of the first companies to uh, allow you to play. LAN speed games, so like Quake and Doom and all these games over a 14-4 modem. But okay. there was, you know, back in the day, again, I have to go back in the day, there was, no, uh, there was no Amazon S3, there were no server hosting companies. So we literally had to build out an entire network of servers on our own. We had our own data center in office, we had a generator on the roof. It was just crazy times. Do you remember the then. figures of roughly how much they raised? Uh, I think all in 65 million over a few rounds. And it's interesting, especially again for newer entrepreneurs, uh, this was not atypical, and in my experience, this is why most uh, founding, founding CEOs were older, yep. because an A round back then was five to ten million dollars, and you weren't going to hand five to ten million dollars to a 23-year-old. No, <laughs> that, that wouldn't be a good idea. So yeah. we actually had, to some extent, I think that back then, just to talk to that, yeah, sure. there was a, a like a, I think it was a, the kind of a condition where there were these two companies, and they, the VCs thought that we should merge these two companies together, and on that condition, we will fund that company. And they ended up being you know, a pretty good combination of media guys that knew how to produce games, and then tech guys that knew how to do networking. I think our CTO was from NASA. And then we had these amazing kind of uh, content guys from a whole different world. But together they created 10. And we actually, you know, like many startups, it was focused on hardcore gaming, over 14 four modems. And then three years later, we, were, we turned into Pogo.com. And we sold Pogo to e Electronic Arts. And for anyone who doesn't get the reference of 14.4 modems, that's 14 kilobytes. Kilobits. <laughs> not, kilobits. Not megabits. <laughs> We're talking about kilobits per second. But yeah. again, in gaming traffic, it, was, it didn't matter. You didn't need a bunch of data to come down. The, the packets were so small, you could actually make it work. Okay. But that was pretty, it was still pretty amazing. So after that, speaking to the Excited Home thing, I, I've, uh, I was actually, I went to At Home Network okay. prior to it being Excited Home. And, and for describe the, what At Home Network was. At Home Network was a pretty amazing company it was basically a it was to some extent a, a venture backed company that was also supported by all of the MSO cable providers and the whole mission was let's create a way for you to actually send data uh, broadband you know doing create the broadband cable modem instead of just sending you know broadcast data let's send data back and forth uh, and that was pretty amazing. So we actually, again, another... Is it, is it, is it the precursor to today's like cable internet access? Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely the precursor. It was, uh, there literally was no broadband over cable until at home. At Home Network invented the cable modem, literally invented it. We had the CTO, again, from NASA, Milo Medin. He came over from NASA and John Doerr, one of the you know, pretty, pretty popular venture capitalists, uh, and Will Hurst, they kind of created the company. And with this mission, again, to allow broadband to happen. But what was really unique about At Home was they did, they did both 
the pipe, so providing a bigger pipe. So instead of, you know, at the time there were other competitors like DSL providers yep. providing um, faster connections over phone lines, but it still wasn't as good as, as the broadband that At Home was providing. But then At Home also focused on content. So everybody was wondering, well, I've got all this fast speed now, but what am I going to do with it? So At Home was very focused on, let's create a content group that's going to make amazing, high quality, you know, uh, broadband specific rich media content and then stream it over our new pipes. And were you at at home, that's hard to say, uh, <laughs> before the acquisition of Excite? Yes, before okay. the acquisition, but after the IPO. Okay. So another you know, <laughs> good, good topic. Okay. But yeah, so I had, because I was at Pogo prior. So I was, you know, at Pogo and I was, I was saying, you know, Pogo was an amazing venture-backed company that eventually sold to EA after I left. But I had moved prior to them selling to EA. Okay. Um, and then, just so you know the story, Excite at Home was supposed to buy Pogo. And they didn't because that you know after Excited Home kind of went up and kind of went up and down. It was a very kind of a boom bust story. Uh, they kind of decided that they weren't going to acquire Pogo, and then EA picked up Pogo. Okay, so you joined at Home after they went public. Yes. So great product manager, not so great at timing. Yes, exactly. And, uh, Thank you for pointing that yeah. out. Mark. <laughs> this is the theme of the early years. Yeah. The timing thing. And uh, talk about why at Home acquired Excite, and just make sure that everyone watching here in the audience and on video understands how important Excite was at the time. Yeah, so Excite was, there were probably two or three search engines, and there was no Google, so everybody, let's, you know, it wasn't there yet. So the, the search engines were Yahoo, Excite, and AltaVista, which yeah. uh, Elon Musk, you know, was one of the founders of that. Um, so there was a bunch of these, and Lycos, there were so many of these search engines, but the whole game there was you started with search was your value prop, and then you kind of leveraged that into being a portal. So you would go license content from all these people. Yahoo was probably the best at it at the I, time, I would right? say from memory, like Yahoo was the number one company. Yeah. The internet company. That was the company everyone wanted to work for. Exactly. And then Excite was a kind of a close second. Yeah. And uh, there's a great book I would recommend to absolutely anyone who wants to understand their history called Burn Rate. Did you ever read Burn I Rate? I did not read Burn it's Rate. It's a phenomenal page turning read <laughs> that will tell you all the intrigues of venture capital startup bullshit yeah and it's all true and it's all come back to yep. happen again and i think it's worth everybody reading but it profiles excite yeah and they, they did uh, you know I, I think early on they had a couple offers again to sell the company but they decided to go it alone but when they did decide to merge finally with at home yeah the 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 deal was a 7.5 billion dollar merger so it was they waited you know they were going to try to get, uh, somebody was trying to buy them early they said no they grew it uh, to a pretty big company, and then all of a sudden, together, 7.5 billion a few years later. What was your role before the acquisition of Excite? Before the role, uh, I was focusing, well, there's an interesting thing, because there's lots of entrepreneurship going on inside of the companies. So I went there to be a product manager handling web hosting. So what, basically, the way it worked is you have a, and it was for the at work division. So there was a business to business division selling access, you know, it's like selling people broadband pipes to your company, and then I would sell the service layer on top. I would say, hey, you need some web hosting because you don't have a website. You need to be able to do e-commerce. You need to do all these things. So that's what I was working on, but at the very tail end of my tenure there, we actually, um, I was on, put on a team that was going to start something called uh, At Work, which was a joint venture between Wall Street Journal and At Work, and we were great, basically creating a business portal that was going to have a community site as, long, as well as content, and that got separately funded and spun out. Uh, but then I had left to do my own startup at the time. Okay, and so you left Excite at Home uh, after the merger. Yeah. And you just didn't see a home in the, oh, that was a t not intentional. <laughs> yeah. You didn't see a place for you in the merged company? Or? Well, I think this is interesting for yeah. your audiences. So I cannot tell you like the, uh, how amazing the venture capital and the whole, the whole like uh, environment was. Everybody was doing a startup. Uh, it was, and again, it was a little unhealthy. So what, 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 what year was this? This was uh, 1998, 99. Okay. Yeah. So I was there for a couple of years, and then 1999, 2000-ish. But everybody was getting started. People were moving into the valley. Everybody was, you know, the, every college graduate and every um, MBA was coming in and being a CEO of some venture-backed company. And so that, a lot of that was happening. And I thought I'd, I'd like to do that. You know, at some point in my life, I'd like to be my own CEO and do all that stuff. So I literally left to do that. And if you were good at PowerPoint, you could raise money back then, right? No, it's true. Yeah. I, mean, I don't want to. I mean, that is a true statement. I mean, because yeah. it wasn't about. There wasn't. It was very different than. Uh, say 2004, 2005, 2006, when you actually had to actually have traction in a business and mm. you had to have some real well, revenue. I'll give you some perspective on it. The perspective is this. 
for the years leading up to 1997 and 1998, there was about $15 billion a year mm -hmm. that went from what's called limited partners, LPs, into venture capital funds, about $15 billion. Yeah. And in three years leading up to 2000, it went to $110 billion a year yeah. and then fell precipitously in 2001, 2002. So you had three years of extreme overfunding yeah. and the number of venture capital funds went up times three. Yep. And so the number of entrepreneurs went up times 25. Yeah, <laughs> and there was too, way too much duplication. There was 18 different pet food selling Well, tell me what your first company was. What did you leave? What did you? Well, I, I was doing, because I was so focused on gaming, what, what ended up happening at Pogo, I, even, I started the world's first professional video game league. And I did okay. it with, so I'll give you, just to give you some background, because sure. at Pogo, I thought we should stick on to hardcore gaming. And everybody else wanted to go to the, the parlor games, the hearts, euchre, spades, because it was easier to, you get more people, it's, it's more of an audience, broader based, and you can, to serve up a user that's playing hearts is much easier than ser serving a guy playing a 3D video game that's rendering in real time in 250 seconds or milliseconds or less. So that problem was very hard to solve, but I, I felt that if we could create a league for video game players, and this is a crazy idea back then, this is, it was almost 10 years too early, because now there's, there's all these companies doing this. Uh, let's do that. So we created the Professional Gamers League, and it just happened that um, our CEO was uh, one of the, it was the actual founder of uh, Electronic Sport or uh, EA Sports. Okay. So he was the guy that was there was a, all, most of the executives at Pogo had come from EA okay. because he came over as a CEO and then did that. So together he let me found it with him or co-found the league okay. and we did it and it was it was a great success but it was it was a little too early and too ahead of his time. So after that I decided you know, I'm gonna go and do some other things. And then I came back around and said, that, that's the company I wanna start. I wanna start something that has to do with gaming and tournaments and community. And so you left in 99, did you raise money? I did, I and raised were, a, were you the CEO of that company? I, I was the founding CEO and I, I had a partner of mine that was, uh, that was a, you know, the founding uh, C, COO and CFO, if you will. Gotcha. Um, and yeah, we did, and we were young, really young and raising money and didn't know what the hell we were doing. And we, we probably did the most, we were probably the most, uh, let's call it the most aggressive and tenacious, but the, the, probably the least efficient. So we had, uh, not, not an efficient in closing, because we, we actually raised money. We raised about three and a half million dollars, but from probably 20 people, okay. or 30 people. I mean, so I again, lost you count. were ahead of your time. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was, but that's what, <laughs> the modern party round. Exactly, okay. that's what it was. And, yeah. uh, and back then it was not very typical to do that because you would try to get a couple people to you know, really back you and then roll forward with those people. But we didn't, we were just really scrappy and really, you know, we were, we were probably, because there were so many people in the ecosystem, probably guys that shouldn't have gotten money, just to be perfectly frank. I mean, not that we didn't have a good idea, but there were seven other people that probably had a better idea, that probably had a better team. And then what happened there was fragmentation again. Like, well, why are there seven people? Why can't we have three people then have three great companies where maybe some of that talent is in the three companies instead of the first around the seven and everybody trying to get their own So you've thing. seen the private to private mergers a few times. Yeah. Uh, what's your assessment of private to private mer uh, mergers? Like, when is it a good idea? When is it a bad idea? Well, I think it really depends on the, well, first and foremost, if you want it to be successful, it has to be, do you agree with the vision? So we did this a lot at, at Demand and some other companies where we bought some, we had some really great acquisitions, but the reason that they actually worked was because it was something more along the lines of, are you spiritually aligned? Like, do you, is your vision the same as ours? Are we going to get bigger together? And some, because you don't want an entrepreneur coming on board and saying, you know, well, I kind of thought, question themselves. I thought I could do it, you know, uh, you know, good with you, but I, it seems like I could have done it better without you and do it yeah. more independent. So we really were focused on making sure we had people that were aligned with the vision and that they also believe that they could roll forward bigger. So let me give you a controversial statement and feel free to disagree sure. with this. I don't believe there's such thing as a merger. I believe only in acquisition. So I think M&A should be A. Sure. And uh, the, my, my reason is this, is if you take, let's say, two unsuccessful companies and mm -hmm. try to put them together, what in essence you're saying is, I've got a right-handed person with a broken left arm and a left-handed person with a broken right arm, and maybe if we tie a, yeah. a rope around us, we can swim across the English Channel. Sure. And uh, I feel like too many private-to-private -to -private mergers, mergers are that, yeah. or this idea that investors are saying, well my company's not really working, we could merge with your company, cut out a bunch of costs and find our way to yeah. efficiency. But the cultural challenges, and there's always winners and losers, mm -hmm. 
And at the end of the day, you end up creating so much infighting that you end up wasting nine yeah. to 12 months. I mean, yeah. is that fair or do you think it's I think, I a think generalization? That, no, I think that the, the acquisition, the way you, uh, the nomenclature is, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's fair. I think that for us, it depends on how you do it, uh, mm -hmm. like you said. For us, it was very important that they, everybody was aligned with the vision and that it wasn't, it was, and it was also something that was, um, was going to incrementally benefit the company. So if it was something that these guys did really well, there was a good fit, but that whole complementary But if you're, component. I mean, let's be honest, if you're doing really well mm -hmm. and you really believe in your vision and your execution, why would you give up half of your company, you know, in a merger when you probably already gave up half to investors? I mean, what it strikes me, the best kind of acquisitions are when one parties a little bit bigger mm -hmm. or much bigger yeah. and they can tuck in other people who maybe couldn't get funding or want a stronger leader or sure. a stark, stronger market position. Yeah. And that's what I think that you know we had done not just at Demand but at other places have done many different types of deals but I think again the theme is those are the types of deals that we ended well, up doing. Demand's a good. perfect case because Demand had significantly more capital than anybody. Yeah. They had an incredibly talented management team and they bought a bunch of smaller assets that they could exploit better than those teams, whether it was eHow, mm -hmm. Plucked, yeah. maybe Plated. Yeah, Daily Plate. Daily Plate, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry, Daily Plate. Yeah. Plated's the newer one. Yeah. Um, but isn't that the case with Demand? Yeah, we, we, that was good because we had, a, we had the platform that uh, the smaller the smaller uh, companies that were acquired could really, you know, grow together with us, and that was really, and they were aligned again with the vision. So, so that was was very successful. So, going back to your startup, did you eventually shut it down? Did you sell it? Yeah, did that you... one we did because it was uh, again. Uh, I think that one was a timing problem, and okay. like we talked about just a little bit earlier, timing is everything, and yeah. really understanding how to read the market and time yourself is important, both from a strategic perspective, but also in financing. It's so, also some amount of luck, right? Like exactly. If, Larry and Sergey graduated three years earlier mm -hmm. or three years later, there probably wouldn't be a Google today. Yeah, and, then, and even if, yeah, if they started a little bit earlier, they might have tried to do something too similar or something, but uh, they were even, well positioned. Even YouTube, like when you think about the emergence of YouTube, it emerged just as browser and streaming technology had advanced one level mm -hmm. that made them able to launch YouTube, which I think couldn't have existed the year before. Yeah, and that's where I think you see things like when, when I mentioned the professional gaming league that I started, that, that was too early. Too I early. Mean, that was just too early. Infrastructure wasn't there. Infrastructure, but the, the, uh, the idea of people wanting to play you know, video games as a professional sport was there because it was happening in Korea. We knew it was working. Yeah. But applying it to this to this market just didn't work. Talk about the wind down because people never talk about that. Yeah. Or if you feel comfortable. No, I will. I mean, that's uh, it's one of the, probably the hardest things. Uh, I mean, you asked I, just to finish that question. Yeah, sure. you asked, uh, we had to. We were timed right. Like it was literally a year and a half, I think, and then 2001 hits, or you know, in that time frame, about two years when that was when the entire it was pretty severe. The entire market just kind of bottomed out. And so people trying to get follow on rounds and all that stuff was almost, it was literally impossible because everybody, even, there was even, you know, it went from very, very, very good or, or not, I wouldn't say healthy because it was, it was good in the, in the eyes that people could raise money, but not healthy mm. to very, very bad where people were, VCs were actually taking money back and saying, hey, you're not, I'm going to claw back this money just because I don't, you know, think you have any shot to do that. So some of the companies that had raised a bunch and had, were all touted in the press were giving their, their investors were taking their money back. I, um, I call that VC triage. <laughs> so, I mean, quite literally, if yeah. you are sitting on top of 40 investments and you're pretty sure 20 of them aren't going to work, you want to put your time, energy, and cash yeah. into the ones that are. And it gets pretty ugly. Yeah. So that, the wind down is, uh, it, uh, one thing I'll say is that you learn a lot from both the success and the failure, but uh, the wind down is just a painful process because there's so much energy that goes into the build process and so much excitement and so much vision and all this other stuff. And in the wind down, there's just nothing really, there's no vision about a great wind down. I mean, it's just not fun for anybody. People have to be let go and all these other things happen and then you have to recover and then you know, get back on your feet and try to do it again. And, and what was hard. the very next thing you did after that company? I went to a comp another company that had, uh, uh, I went, so usually what happens, and I'm, I've been doing this for a while, I've been, I've probably done nine or 10 startups where I've started them or been part of one. Uh, I would uh, almost like go back, get a job so that I could recover from the startup. And that's usually, whether you have kids or not, even if you're single, you have to do that. You have to just kind of recover, get like your bearings Emotionally straight. and financially. Exactly, right? and then yeah. you just gotta figure things out. So I did that, I worked for, a, but I went to a company that happened to, out of that whole crash, happened to do pretty well and raised 
at the right time, they raised about $20 million, and they were doing some stuff that was pretty cool and had some revenue coming in, so I was What was that company? It. That was a company called Pulse, and the, the, what they did was, uh, it was a bunch of founders from Macromedia who had okay. started Pulse, and the, the whole concept of Pulse was they wanted to do 3D in the browser, and they wanted to do that very early on. But, uh, so it was supposed to be like the extension of Macromedia. Macromedia was rich media in the browser, Pulse was gonna be 3D in the browser. And I think all in, they might have raised I think it was, again, close to 60, you know, something like that, or right. even definitely more than and, 20. And you you did Intermix, Intermix before your next startup? No, after Pulse, I okay. moved to, that's when I... Intermix I, before Daily Plate, or Daily yeah. Plate before Intermix? No, in, uh, <laughs> Intermix before Daily Plate. Okay, so let's yeah. talk about Intermix. Yeah, so Intermix was, uh, uh, again, Intermix was an interesting company that was, pr prior to that was a company called E-Universe, which was a company that, again, was pretty scrappy, did a bunch of stuff, aggregated a bunch of properties together, made some made some money and had a platform that they could put other things on. Um, but uh, some of the stuff wasn't working, so they were almost like this big conglomerate that had all these different businesses, but um, it needed to be wasn't focused. Wasn't basically a direct marketing company? Yeah, they did, they, it was basically the email and other things. But Selling they, face creams and Well, that was, a, that was a little different. Some of that stuff, there were different divisions of that, okay. but we started to get down to where when, when the company was so, doing so many different things, most of it was uh, online marketing and, and whatnot, and, and, but also doing web, websites, gaming sites, all this other stuff. We, we divided the company into three different groups, and one of those groups happened to be a company called MySpace. And it was a failed marketing business that the guy said, hey, we have this other idea. Can we just you know, regroup and do this other idea? So they did that within the construct of Intermix Media. And Intermix owned, you know, I think, a majority of that, and then basically it was becoming so successful that uh, it become, became a company that got separate funding and was able to you know, be uh, Grow on its own, and you stayed at the Intermix level, or did you ever? Yeah, get involved I did. And then MySpace? I did. No, I was only there for eighteen months, so we'd done all that, and then basically we sold the company to Fox, uh, the whole company. So MySpace, including uh, Intermix as the parent, and all of the assets. So we talked last week with Amit Kapoor a lot about MySpace. Yeah. So I won't go into that. Sure, sure. Tell us about Daily Plate. Uh, how did that idea come up? What was that startup? What was your role? Yeah. So I was. Uh, so after um, after MySpace, my just. A few friends of mine. This is actually probably what I'll say is the best startup uh, in my mind. Is we started a company that we really had a product need we were trying to solve that was our own need. We you know either we're trying to gain gain weight and get fit or lose weight, and so we started this thing and we were all going to very, our, the, th the three of us started it and two guys were trying to lose weight and I was trying to just you know just be more fit. And what we found is that it was really hard to track everything. So you have to write things down on a piece of paper and you, whether you're weight training or whether you're trying to diet and all these different food facts and, and it was just hard and it wasn't scalable and you couldn't get any reports and all that. So we actually created an app. I and mean, this again was before mobile apps really were around. We created a website. And that website was a, a nutrition wiki. It was basically a wiki that had every nutrition uh, kind of label that was, a, whether it's a generic thing like a banana or whether it was something at Trader Joe's or whether it was a hamburger at uh, Again, McDonald's. Again, a precursor to my fitness pal and all of Daily that. Burn. And all of that, yeah. All of these that came later. Uh, did you raise funding for that? No, that's okay. why I said it was one of the most, you know, because one, what it was was a bunch of guys spending what I'll call a small amount of hours on the side doing mm -hmm. something you're passionate about. You do that uh, and you just kind of build it and there's no pressure, you're just kind of building something that's really great and all of a sudden it just starts growing organically. And did you monetize it? Was it yeah, ad we did. supported? We had, no, we had a subscription. Uh, it did have ads but it was not the line share. The, what was the line share of the revenue was actually a subscription model where you actually could pay a yearly fee and it was, you know, you pay some modest yearly fee and you get more tracking data. You get to save more data. We do more reports for you. So getting more data about you as a, as and a person. And we've talked about four or five or six companies now. Were you always in a product capacity at these companies? Yeah, so I was always the guy. Uh, and from the very beginning, that's what I've done. I've, I've been a product person. So somebody that can, you know, like you, you have an idea and you want to be able to somehow coordinate people that either report to you or not. Yeah. Or, and just make something. And so you really have to go from whiteboard to What do code. you think makes a great product person? Uh, I definitely think you, well, first you have to have a passion for doing it. Uh, a product is not a, it's not, it might sound like it's a cool thing to a lot of people that don't know about it, but when you actually get into it, it's a lot of, it's a lot of leadership and managing people, and most of those people don't actually work for you most of the time, and if you go to, if you're at Google, like you're a product manager, you don't manage the engineers directly, they don't report to you, they don't really answer to you, and so you have to figure out how to be a great leader, but you also have to be able to have a vision, and you have to communicate that vision to a group of people, 
and then get them excited about it, and then get them to actually execute it, and then grow it and do all these other things. So it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty involved, uh, you know, role. Give us examples of product managers you've worked with, or take your own experiences, and what do you think makes a great product manager for anyone who may be hiring one or thinking about becoming one themselves? Uh, I think first and foremost is ma matching somebody to the product they're working on with a real passion. You have to have a passion for what you're working on because it actually shows up in the work. Uh, and so if you're doing something that you may not be a fan of or if you're working on a product that's just something that you know you have to ship it but you're not really a fan yourself or wouldn't use the product yourself, I call it doing the self-test. If, you right. if you're somebody that knows exactly what you want, then it's easier to build it, right? Because you're saying, well, there's a hole in the market and it's exactly here. If you, if you, if you aren't, you might miss the market. You might just say, well, I, I, I thought it was this, but I don't, I'm not the customer, right. so how will I know? So that's, that's really the, one of the I, most important I've things. observed this a lot with uh, young male entrepreneurs, maybe three or four years, five years out of college, mm -hmm. who see, spot a market opening in a women's category. Yep and decide that they can do it without any women on their leadership team. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there are examples where it's worked, but more often than not, I find a missing resonance with their tactile understanding of the market. And if I'm really honest, mine. Yeah. So I've even funded a couple of them, and then I feel like I can't contribute as much to yeah. that. So I think it's... It, it's very important, and I think that I can't, I mean, again, the Daily Plate was such a passion for me, and then that's, it kind of led to other things where... What about, what about visual skills? In terms of do, design? Do you, or? On your product team, do you need to have visual skills? Or you can have visual skills on the tech team and the product manager just has to be a great leader of that. No, person. I think, uh, well, there's, this is where it gets interesting. There are different flavors of product managers. So there are some people, if you had like a meter, there are guys that are uh, great product managers that are closer to engineering. So they're more technical product managers. Okay. There are guys that are more design and aesthetic product managers, right? So they may have come, they might have come from a producer background in film or TV, or did like on YouTube, especially. You see a lot of these great filmmakers that also are great producers. That's yeah. the word. But it's the if you take producer and product manager, they're almost the same exact tactical roles. You make sure that people are doing stuff. You hit deadlines. You do all these other things. But producer is a little more artistic, and product manager could be a little more technical. So it just depends on what your background is. And I think a lot of uh, really great product managers, especially you're seeing a lot of this in the Valley and some of the newer startups in LA are people that are doing everything. You literally could, and we have some of these guys that are just amazing, where you can basically code, do the design, understand the community, use the product, and actually can you So know, let's do anything. talk about this. If you're a startup and you have eight people in total, and let's say five or six of them are engineers, yeah. and increasingly engineers are developing these skills, When's the right time to hire a product manager in your mind? Well, I think that depends on the type of organization. So if you were to say some of these engineering organizations now uh, really need a product manager to keep them in touch with the consumer. That's, you know, so it depends on if you, if you have a lot of hardcore engineers that don't have as much of the artistic aesthetic, then you need to have a product manager earlier. But if you have these guys that are full stack, cross trainers, literally are one man bands, mm -hmm then you may not need one. Like, there's we don't have one right now. There's never a truism, but it strikes me, uh, sticking to your LA, uh, yeah. Hollywood analogy. Sure. For me, great developers are often writers, and writers are the lifeblood of the film and television industry. Without them, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, coders are the lifeblood of tech startup community, and yet writers don't necessarily end up being great at managing projects and budgets and other people, mm -hmm. which is why you have writers and producers. Yeah. And I wonder if there's that tension between coders, which are very creative, sometimes temperamental, mm -hmm. um, very creative people, and the need to have management. Yeah, I think that, uh, well, that's kind of where it's, it's interesting as well there, because uh, having a, managing a creative person yeah. is not necessarily something you always want to do. Is it an oxymoron? It's a little bit uh, tough sometimes, but I think, because I think where they really shine is if they're, if you have a vision and they can see the North Star and they can go for it, but they can get there in a very creative way, you'll be surprised at how amazing the solution is versus managing your way to it using a product manager. So maybe a great leader, I don't want to put words in your mouth, yeah. but a great leader um, of tech projects uh, points people to the answer but is less prescriptive about how one should get there. Yeah, I especially think in this world, because there are so many people that are cross trainers now that were, weren't before, and, uh, and it's, it's almost like a whole generation of these people have surfaced. And you want to just guide them, you don't want to, you don't want to be too So Demand Media bought your company? 
Yeah. Or, or did you join Demand Media? No, I joined prior, and then I was, it was something that I had been doing okay. prior to that. So You left, yeah. joined Demand Media, and then they bought yeah. Daily, Daily Plate. Yeah. Okay. And what was your role at Demand Media? Uh, so I was the head of product and marketing, at, uh, when we, and I was one of the uh, founding team members. So there was about six of us that founded the company and uh, basically you know, grew the company from, in 2006, from, uh, you How did know, it happen that six of you founded it? Did Richard just call you up and say, hey, I remember you from the Intermix days. We'd yeah. love to go do something big. Yeah, and I had worked, uh, I had kind of touched, crossed paths with Richard over many years. Richard but, Rosenblatt is the founder. Uh, yeah. Was he the, he wasn't the founder of Intermix? No, he was. He came, he came on in, later, He came right? on later and uh, he came on to, um, as a CEO and then, uh, uh, and then we, he was the one that uh, did the transaction with Fox. But at Demand Media, what was the sales pitch to you of why you should come join the tribe? Uh, it was basically we have this, you know, this vision of what we want to do and you know, to really think, of, think differently about how we could do media. And okay. uh, for me, it was something that I was excited about being on a team. So just, this goes back to this whole entrepreneurial cycle thing again. So you, when you're an entrepreneur and you, you step into the front role, sometimes you, you figure out that, you know what? I'm tired right now, I want to kind of work on a team that I have other people that are working as hard as me and thinking about the problem as much as I am. So that was kind of what that was for us. At Demand, we had an all-star team of people that very much could have all been CEOs of a, maybe a smaller company, but coming together, and I think that's what I'm a little bit, to some extent, a little frustrated with nowadays, is that there's, there's a lot of companies. Right. And if we could just not have as many companies, that, but they could work closer together, or we could have management teams that so are paired So it's the dream up. team, like you brought together the dream team. Yeah, and, and then some of us, again, uh, I just came off another startup and yeah. you know, was kind of ready to do something where I had more support and more of a team. That, but you, was, you still want to have that, you still have that drive, uh, and you could lead a, a, a bunch of things, but you could do more together as you could separately. So I want to give enough time to talk about Tastemade. Sure. At Demand Media, you were involved with a group of people who built video tools, right? Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about those tools and then how you got the idea that you should leave and go create Tastemade. Yeah, so at, uh, at the time, uh, we, we started to see the video was, was just growing amazing because it was, uh, I think, 2006, 2007, and YouTube had just started 2005, but it was just growing phenomenally. So um, we had to build tools to mostly manage the content. There was a lot of content that was being created, and I think at the time was trying to figure out how do you get people to discover that content. So trying to get people to discover content and organize it, basically, because there was so much. And YouTube was just like this ground, the, this, you know, this video, just wild place that had all this stuff, and you, it was really difficult to find. So we started to channelize things and verticalize things so that people could actually find them. But in doing that, we became one of YouTube's largest partners, providing you know, a ton and ton of video uh, that they couldn't even really, like early days it was we had to uh, do some things where they couldn't really ingest all the video that we were trying to organize and send to them. So we had to focus a lot of the technology on organizing the organizing all of the video, but then also then creating new video. So we would, we, we would work with crowdsource freelancers and provide a, 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 a system that allowed them to find what uh, video roles there could be for them to actually make. So the, the typical thing that would happen is a freelancer would go somewhere and have to find a job uh, you know, just kind of with the, their network, and, and we try to make that a little more seamless in a, a marketplace. So that was that was our er, early focus on that, um, but we were really mostly largely focused at demand, uh, probably more than 50 percent, a little bit more than 50 percent, mostly on text. You know, so video was a fast-growing thing within demand, and yeah. that's what we saw at TasteMate is, what if we could actually focus just on video? And, and to be fair to you, because I was teasing you on timing earlier. Sure. You left after the IPO on demand media, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Just I did. Sure. No, I did. Uh, we, uh, but, and then about a year after. Okay. Uh, and then for me, I'd been there six years. And if you look at my past, I had never been anywhere for six years. So for me, it was, I'm an entrepreneur and I wanted to do the next thing. And it was a timing thing uh, mm -hmm. for me as well. I was so excited to learn. While we had done really well with mobile and video at demand, it wasn't the 100% focus, and everything we're doing on Tastemade now is focused around video and mobile. And Talk about it. the original vision for Tastemade. So the original vision is still the vision today, which was basically we saw 20 years ago, there were companies like the Food Network that saw an amazing shift from broadcast to, to um, satellite and cable, where you have, when every time there's an amazing shift, as you know, there's massive opportunity to create a new business. And so all the people that were doing broadcast television couldn't do cable really well, right? So we're, we, we kind of looked at the same thing. 20 years later, we think we can do uh, the, what the Food Network and what Scripps has done and some of the other um, players out there, Discovery Channel has done, and create lifestyle programming for an audience 
but that is 100% focused on digital. So nowadays, people are consuming content very differently. They're not sitting in front of their TV all the time. They are some of the time, but they're also watching on their phones, watching on tablets. They're watching one minute, three minute, six second shows, not 22 minute and 40, 45 minute shows with commercials interlaced, right? So we said that's gotta be a massive opportunity, but in order to do that, you have to completely rethink it. And so you really can't come from some of the, you can't be a cable company necessarily innovating that as much, and you have to be a startup and you have to think about everything soup to nuts. So we and, and at the time, YouTube networks were becoming pretty prolific. How did you think about should we be a YouTube network? I guess people ended up calling them MCNs. Yeah. Should we have owned and operated websites? Should we produce for over the top? How did you think about that problem? And what did you actually do? Yeah, so we thought of the problem as you cannot be, and we even coined the phrase back in the, internally, it was, we called it 4D. You have to be four dimensional. No longer could you be just focused on YouTube as a platform or Facebook. If you think about Zynga and all the game platforms that just went on Facebook, or even Twitter or Pinterest or any of these, you had to look at the problem and say, these are all very different networks. These are where the audience is. So how do you create content that's specific to that audience? So we started, while we started on YouTube, because it was, you couldn't ignore YouTube. If you were doing video, as you know, you had to do video and you had to do it on YouTube, but it didn't mean that it should be your whole strategy. And so we quickly set out to establish ourselves on YouTube and establish the brand with our content and our aesthetic and all that. But at the same time, we started development on our mobile app, which was completely our own. We thought of our mobile app as what would be owned and operated. So instead of doing a website in 2012 when we started the company, we decided let's not do a website, let's do a mobile app because we can get audience directly to that mobile app and it can be our own audience. So that's what we've done. Those have been the first two, but now what we're seeing is we're seeing ourselves programming our content that's either created for YouTube or for our mobile app to Facebook. Again, that's part of that four-dimensional problem. It's not just about those networks, it's about all the networks and figuring out how to program to each one. And I'm not 100% sure how your app has evolved, but when I used it, when you guys launched it, I think it was one of the most innovative in terms of your thinking about video creation. It was in your vertical, so it was yep. food, restaurants. It was enabling UGC, so an end user could go create a video of their favorite restaurant. Yep. And it was templated, which made it easier for people to create. You would tell people, take a six second shot of you walking into the restaurant, take a 20 second shot of you eating food, take a 15 second shot of you panning the room, yep. and then you would weave through the transitions and music and everything else. Um, how did you make those decisions? Uh, what did you learn from that experience? Great, great question. That's one of the things that we're, we were super excited about is that we really wanted to make sure that it was almost produced UGC. So yeah. think of it as I can, I can guarantee the quality of UGC if I can produce a portion of it. So just like you said, we, 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 we made a storyboard and we actually only allowed you to pick certain music tracks. So a lot of music on the internet, people just take music and we only had 18 selected um, tracks and those tracks were looped for a minute long for the format that we had created and they were licensed by us and rights cleared and all that good stuff. And then we paired them with title cards and, and fonts and packages so that to some extent, just like Instagram did really well, we made you a more creative person than you actually are. So we actually helped produce half of that. And, and in, in, in light, we also got uh, control of the quality. Uh, but in terms of what you're saying, the, the, the one thing that I think was the most important is that we took, we actually looked at the end goal, what problem were we trying to solve? And we said we wanted to create amazing, gorgeous, high quality video that looks like television, but was made for mobile. And we did that, and then we, and then we solved the engineering problem after that. So we, to your point, you can't get a, format like that uh, unless you really understand, well, what, how does it have to look like a television show? Right? My vision at the time, having used it, and I, everyone I saw, I would say, this is where I think video will eventually go. Yeah. Because video is a different kind of medium. I mean, anyone can write a paragraph and publish it and people can read and consume it. Yeah. Anyone can take a photo and we can say, is it good, is it bad, but it's easy to consume. Video is a very difficult thing to create, creating a narrative, creating quality and transitions and sound and music. Um, I had always imagined though, that you would need to create different template types or let's call them different storyboards. Yeah. So here's the, I'm going to a restaurant and that could lead to a really rich experience of restaurant reviews. But then there might be a separate template, which is here's how I make a souffle. Yep. And I don't know if you ever took it in that direction. I haven't used it in a few months. Uh, is it something you thought about? Did you do it? Yeah, Did we definitely thought about it from the beginning, just like when we thought about the company, whether you were going to be lifestyle or just focus on food. And initially our thought was, let's nail food and be really ex exceptional at it. 
because there's so much nuance in getting a, a food video to mm -hmm. be good. But what we've seen with the app is that uh, the users are hacking it. So the users already are doing okay. the cooking videos. They already, we found a woman who was doing uh, travel videos, a man who did a, a video when he went to Angkor Wat in Cambodia, and he, instead of doing, he took the exact same format and he just hacked it and used all the transitions and the music and all that stuff. And we actually saw, uh, we just recently found a, a, a woman that was a Swedish model uh, shopping, showing so like what the beauty girls do on YouTube, yeah. but she just used it to actually say, let me show you how to shop. Right. And see, she goes into different stores and goes into different places. So what's great about it is there is a format, but the format is open to some extent. But we're trying to focus again on what, guiding them. What didn't work in the mobile app the way you thought it would, and how did that change your product strategy? Yeah, I think. Uh, well, I think what didn't work is we we tried a lot of uh, we did a lot we do a lot of iterative testing and, and, and releasing. That's really the way of product these days is that you're always releasing product and getting user feedback. And one was uh, the open format saying, create your own story, create your own, choose your own adventure. Mm -hmm. we, had a, we had a fork in the road at one point where we said, you can choose the template or you can choose this. And it just didn't work very well because people sit there in front of it and say, all right, what am I going to do now? Who's directing me? Where should I go? What should right. I do? So it's like very complicated if you don't have some direction. And even though these are creative people, some of these people are amazing creative people that can even edit really great video on their own using their DSLR camera on their Mac. But what was really cool is that the app allowed them to actually finish the video and actually get through it. So we, we had some, some uh, food bloggers who were really great at video and could be really great on YouTube, but just uh, never, they, they told us they had terabytes and terabytes of data uh, on their hard drives of unfinished, unedited video because there was nothing, there was no like, Forcing Nothing, function. Force, yeah, force me to finish, right? Yeah. So that's kind of what we did, and we saw that happen. And talk a little bit. So you've got YouTube, you've got an app. Have you done anything over the top, anything with Roku or Xbox or PlayStation? Or uh, If not, how do you see that market going in the future? Uh, we think it's a very exciting market. I mean, those devices, Apple TV, Roku, all just those two alone are selling really well. And we have a lot of them, you know, are, we'll use them in our homes. Um, but we, we've done some things and experiment with that. And it is, uh, you know, it's just early on right now. But, is it uh, too early, do you think, for over-the-top I don't think it's too early because I think it's one of those things that's going to sneak up on us real fast because there's so many people that have those devices if now. I, if I could say it this way, the thing that, you know I invested in Maker Studios yeah. and the thing that Maker Studios nailed, a lot of these markets are timing and luck. Mm -hmm. We nailed that we were in the market when it was easy to get on the YouTube homepage if you knew what you were doing. Yeah. So algorithmically, they knew how to get on the homepage. So if you had content that worked, then it would just take off. And I think that's true of any platform. If you look at why did Zynga succeed, it yeah. timed the Facebook platform really well and MySpace yeah. platform before that. If you think about you know, some of the initial iPhone apps like Bump, yeah. and why those really took off. I mean, they were early in the platform. The, the most challenging thing about over the top is it could be that that exponential growth is three years from now or five years from now yeah. or five months from now, and I'm not sure, but when it happens, it's gonna be enormous, and I actually think it's the next great battleground after mobile. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're getting ahead of ourselves on VR, I think. Yeah. Like VR is 10 years out or eight years out. The battle for the living room's coming to a theater near you. Maybe even in your home. Yeah, and what do you? I mean, that would um, for us that again is uh, it's an important thing to think through, and, and it's really the which one, which of the platforms is going to be there that's going to be, or is it going to be a multi-platform strategy again, where you have to make your bets on on multiple ones? And there's I mean, no question it's multiple, and I don't know over time if the norms will work out that someone wins the living room, mm -hmm. but we've seen uh, with Xbox and PlayStation, Twitch TV, like just beautifully jujitsu that market yeah. in a way that nobody was thinking about. Um, I've seen a lot of people now building for Roku. We'll see if they have the demand, but I'm hearing that you know some shows are getting discovered. Amazon Fire is the dark horse to me. I think Amazon yeah. Fire is going to crush it, you yeah. know, but it's early days and they're going to have to work out their product. I don't know. Will Netflix open up? Will well, one thing we're, we're yeah. excited about, and I think you as an investor and maker is, is, could be excited about as well, is that it's, it's there, especially in LA, mm -hmm. there is a role for content. Whereas if this were in Silicon Valley, it yep. may be a little bit different. It may be more about the technology distribution or algorithms or whatever. But all of these networks, including all of this over the top, all of the Facebooks, Twitters, all of the digital ones, all the Googles, everybody needs content. Yeah. So that was our whole premise for starting the business. So you asked about the vision early on. The vision early on for Tastemade was let's 
create, let's be excellent at creation. Let's actually create something that, not only just uh, the, you know, a system, but also a community of people, we call them food lovers, that come together to create amazing video. And they can create it on an iPhone or a Galaxy or whatever. They can create it on their smartphone or they can create it for YouTube. But however they create it, we wanted to bring them together and actually create content because that content is good enough. Like when, if you create it in HD mm -hmm. and you create high quality program that is show like, like it is on television, it can go to television. So that's kind of our, our whole premise from the very beginning, and I agree with you, it's, it's a huge opportunity, uh, and we think being a content creator is a good place to be. So going in the opposite direction, you and I both probably have a product and film sensibility of high quality. Uh -huh. Even if it's a different quality than maybe Hollywood sets out, it's still high quality. And yet, it seems like Vine which is the most shit quality, mm -hmm. massively took off. Why do you think that is, and what can we learn from that? I think to make something beautiful, you can't really make it in six seconds. And if you do make it in six seconds, it's, well, try watching 60 seconds of those. Yeah. So I think our whole premise was to make something beautiful is really, really hard. And, yeah. it may, and, it, and in order for it to be super viral and super fast growing, sometimes it has to be really easy. Mm -hmm. And I think those are the, that's the constant battle you're trying to solve. Do you then think Vine is more ephemeral and people will graduate to a better experience? Or is there something about our age or sensibilities that just don't quite... I think there's a place for everything. And I think they have a place where they, those videos for what you're trying to do and for that audience is a perfect, it's a perfect app for that. Mm -hmm. And I think what we were trying to do is we were solving a different problem. So I think there are a lot of different apps that are solving different problems. You know, Instagram with a 15 second or different, different uh, you know, levels of uh, length, but also different levels of quality and artis artistry. So I think that there is a place for that. And I think that it's, we're just doing something different. Right. Um, in terms of taste made, what are the next big things on your agenda that are not confidential? Like yeah. what are the what's uh, out on the horizon? Well, we're very excited about, uh, you know, again, it's a platform thing, so yeah. getting, uh, focusing on Android. So we've mm -hmm. been working on Android and we're mm -hmm. excited to launch that soon. Uh, so that's, that's exciting. And um, it's just because there's so many people that haven't been able to experience, you know, both the view side of our product as well as creation and to be able to do that to a whole nother market. And it's pretty amazing thinking that, you know, we, you know, not everybody has an iPhone right now uh, and there's so many great smartphones out there. So it's really cool to, to be able to address that market uh, and see our, we've got a lot of users that have been actually asking for it. So I just want to call out again that if you have any interest in asking a question, just flash your hand up. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep <laughs> steamrolling. I have 50 more questions. But I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Um, what about social? Like, How is social changing video consumption? And maybe I'll tee yeah. it up in a statement that I'd love you to expand on. OK. My sense is social was the way that YouTube got distributed and also massively increased YouTube consumption. Mm -hmm. But most social consumption is wrapped in a YouTube wrapper. And I feel like Facebook and Twitter, as they now have to focus on ad growth, are going to want to unbundle that and start selling their own pre-roll. Mm -hmm. If I'm correct in this, how does this change the nature of video consumption? Will you have to design a slightly different video for YouTube than Facebook than Twitter? Or you just design one native format and push it out on all three? Or what do you think will happen with social going forward? And what do you think is happening today? Yeah, so I think for us, we don't change the creation. What we change is the programming. So how do you program to those networks? So for example, with Facebook, we're doing some things now where we're very focused on local programming. So mm -hmm. we'll take videos from our app and we'll program them locally and we're building a local audience. Mm -hmm. But we're also trying some other stuff from, with our YouTube stuff. How, how does that work when you say local? Is it a fan page that's local? Yeah, it's in L Los Angeles. So if you, were to if you want to find the best restaurants in LA, we mm -hmm. have a Facebook fan page that now has about almost 70,000 fans but on it. But isn't the fan page deprecated in terms of how things get pushed into the stream? Unless you pay, uh, well, is it we, still valuable to have fan pages we think, in your we, mind? We think it is, depending on you know. Again, building an we were trying to build an audience that is very 
focused and targeted. Mm -hmm. So uh, for us, there's there's a lot of ways to potentially do that, but there with we're, with the traffic and with uh, getting the traffic and getting enough people to be able to come to it in an area that. Uh, where they're wanting to consume that type of content. We mm -hmm. think places like Facebook, we're seeing it with Pinterest, we're also seeing it uh, with Twitter, but we're not, for example, with Twitter, we're not necessarily programming local right now, we're programming, programming more, uh, you know, more of a global type thing, but we, we're, we're gonna see if those things work uh, on that. But that's, for us, it's a lot of trial and error trying to figure out what does that audience want to see? Because uh, as you know, a Twitter audience is so temporal, yeah. so different that it's much more about in the moment, rapid fire, real time, and so that doesn't necessarily have to be just catered to local right now. And in terms of uh, Twitter, is there anything that you guys are working on that's unique on Twitter? Do you, and do you think Twitter itself will start selling pre-roll? Are, are you We're even monetizing through, through advertising today? Uh, yeah, we are. Okay. Yeah, but uh, just to answer your Twitter question, we are actually... So we are actually a, uh, a, a Twitter card partner. So we're, when you go into Twitter and you open a card, it'll have our player in there so you don't have to click through and all that. So it's, that's, that's one thing that is becoming a more native experience. Mm -hmm. So we're working on with Twitter on, on things like that. We also were and one of- And you built your own player? Uh, yes, we did. Did you use open source technology or it's your player? No, we, yeah, some combination some of that. Combination yeah. of the two. But it is our player inside. So instead of it being us having to upload a video to YouTube and then yeah. get it into Twitter. And then again, the, 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 the nuance is that instead of you going to some just thing that looks like a link. It's a beautiful Twitter card with the thumbnail of the video, so you're getting that. Uh, again, a user doesn't have to go two clicks in. They're already seeing it up front. The other thing is we're, um, we're actually uploading uh, videos native to Twitter, which not everybody's doing right now. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty interesting because, again, it comes out. Like, and you've probably seen Twitter's pages are changing. They're much more content-oriented. Mm -hmm. So for someone like us who's, again, making content, that was the strategy, is focus on the content and then the distribution because how could they not do video? You know, right. Twitter, Facebook, all the Pinterest. How can they not focus on video? That's where all the big dollars are. Exactly, and it's it's easier for advertisers to say, "Oh, I do this thing on television. I can move it over." Than it is to say, "How do I translate that into a microsite yeah. with a bunch of pictures and Turns images?" Turns out it's what users want. Also, exactly. <laughs> so that's that's again what's interesting is I'd say it's programming to answer your question earlier. Yeah. So it's all about not creation but programming in that regard. Now, uh, what about owned and operated um, in the early days of video? Most of the thesis was build owned and operated because you can't monetize on YouTube. So yeah. we had Funny or Die, you had Break Media, you mm -hmm. had Chib Jab, you had College Humor. Um, the beauty of owned and operated, which means it's your own website, your own URL, yeah. is you can sell at much higher uh, CPMs, yep. much higher ad rates, and you have way more control. The harder thing is driving audience and building an engaging audience. Yeah. How do you think about owned and operated? Is it an important part of people's strategy? How much budget should they put into it? How do you drive traffic to it? Yeah, I think for us, it's a, uh, and for everybody, it's a question of what's more important, uh, investing in that web strategy or mobile. Uh -huh. I mean, because I mean, even if you do a owned and operated, you're, you're building a website. Website's a whole nother, think of it as just another client. You've got, you know, you're, you've got all the mobile clients that you have to deal with, and even if you're doing tablets versus phones, you've got to deal with all those different nuances, and then you have to deal with the web, and you have four or five different browsers or whatever you have to do, so it really depends on what your focus is. And it's not, uh, for some companies, especially ones that do video, it's not that easy to translate just mobile web onto, uh, you know, to be in view, to, or, or take you, taking the web and making it mobile web. So you have to make that call because everybody's so wanting the fast speed of an app. Uh, so that's, that for us, it's a, it's a question always of balancing which one's more important right now. And in terms of uh, other stuff outside of video, you have a role as an advisor at USC. And uh, I wrote here, it's the Center for Body Computing. Yeah. And that seems a bit far afield. Do you do that because you just want to stay apprised of what next, or that's a passion area? It's a, it's a passion area. Uh, with the Daily Plate, I mean, at, at, at the Daily Plate's biggest, we, we grew a company from nothing to over 50 million unique visitors, and people were tracking 700, doing 700,000 health check-ins a day on our mobile app. Wow. Uh, and that, to me, was uh, the early foray into understanding all of this information, health information about you. And nowadays, it's all wearables, right? So wearables are, uh, some of the stuff that you have to manually, had to manually report a decade ago is now being automatically reported. But what we're, what the Body Computing Center does is it's, it's going to the next level. It's basically some of the stuff is embedded on pacemakers, some of it's you wear, uh, skin tattoos, 
So some of the wearables aren't even wearables, they're is implanted. It, is it part for medical? Is that is it a big medical focus at USC or it's a balance between medical and It's general? medical and lifestyle because medical should be focused, it should be together as opposed to it just being everything is about you going to your doctor. It should be, well, right. why don't you have a lifestyle that promotes healthiness, yeah. which is habits that make you, so that's been a passion of mine. And uh, they're, you know, and what's interesting is been doing that for about seven years that, or they've, they've had that, com they have a conference every year but nowadays, as you guys have seen, and wearables are everywhere, and they're like the, this big thing that everybody's doing. But again, it, you still have to make a great application for that. You can't just, you know. It seems do that. like a lot of the health wearables are a bit like diets. You yeah. use them for six to twelve weeks, and then it's like <laughs> you, change, you change, right? And then you put it down, and you're like, well, yeah. this device must be shit. I'm gonna go to the next one. Yeah. So it was like <laughs> low fat was shit. So then it yeah. was like low carb. Mediterranean carbs, or whatever. You know? but, uh, but doesn't it feel a bit like that? And, and uh, what do you think the next big innovation is? I think it does on the, on the device side, but when, what, where I think it's really powerful is if I can tell you constantly throughout the day all of this health information about you, uh, you would react differently. You would change, you might walk more, you might, like that was the whole thing, concept behind Nike's fuel band is just get up and move a little bit more. But you might walk more, you might eat differently, you might uh, do different things, and I think that would, that's where it's very powerful. I'm gonna give you last chance for questions. Question up front, uh, if we could get the microphone. Thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Ariel, I'm co-founder and CEO of Sensei. The uh, question I had was, so we see our worlds uh, evolving from, from broadcast media to a personal stream. Right? Yeah. And as that goes from a two-foot experience to a 10-foot experience, the question is, we still monetize using an, a broken ad model, right? So can we do better than skip this ad in five, four, three, two, click? You know, everyone clicks, right? Yeah. Can we, especially with custom players, do better than that? Yeah, I think we're, we're pretty excited and we've experimented with some things like for pay. So a lot of the things could be either just class uh, based where we're doing some things. We did some tests where we're doing, we might sell you a cooking class that you would normally pay 100 bucks for and we'll sell it to you for 40 bucks. Uh, but it'll be an hour long instead of six hours. It won't be in a physical place, just like somewhere like here. But, but the value of that is that you have it on your, your, your tablet at your house and you can watch it all over and over again. So that's one thing. And then potentially taking more and more of that behind the subscription or, or paywall content and bundling it to, into a subscription. But I think what, to, to what Mark was saying, I think the opportunity for over the top is massive and I think it will be, people will be bundling that stuff behind a subscription and as opposed to trying to just monetize on Advertising. I mean, that to me is just, it's basically doing what the cable companies did. People know how to do that. They're willing to pay for that. And you're seeing, even though they're younger kid, people and, and the millennials, they may not pay for a $172 direct TV subscription, but they'll pay for all of their different things, like their Netflix and their other things that they want. Uh, and they'll just kind of do so it So we're moving separately. to an a la carte world. Yeah, just, uh, but I think still subscription, but just picking the brands you want, right? So I would just say this on advertising. First of all, uh, the problem with people who want super creative ads is it's very hard to have an entire industry, let's say a hundred billion dollar industry, uh, without having standards. Mm -hmm. So that's an important thing to consider because every company that I've seen be super creative about how they do ads, you can sell your initial test buys, but it's very hard to scale when you start dealing with many different brands, many different agencies, yeah. all of whom are not as obsessed with technology as we are. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would also point out that many of people's assumptions about ads and about TV are just wrong if you look at the data. So for many years, my wife worked, not many years, for a few years, my mm -hmm. wife worked at Google in their TV group. And she had all the data from the set-top boxes. Yeah. And we, uh, this crowd, assumes that everybody skips commercials, but actually the majority of people don't skip commercials. So even though we think ads are a total waste, it turns out that they're not. And uh, even TrueView, which is what you're referring to, which is this ad is skipping in yeah. five seconds, please kick, click. It's true that a large number of people click, and I know I do nar nearly every time, but in aggregate, when you're talking about billions of views, there's still meaningful amounts of people who watch the ads. And finally, I would say there are other types of ads which have become standards, like mm -hmm. brand integration. You know, I'm sure many of you saw the Evian ad. Have you seen this Evian ad where the older people are dancing in front of a, 
um, um, a window where uh -huh. they can see their reflection, uh -huh. and they do dances, and you can see the little kids dancing. And the I don't have you seen. I haven't this? seen that. No. You, you should go. You should go search for it when you get home. It's one of the best uh, ads ever created in online. I think it's got like 90 million views. Oh wow! But you know, everyone remembers the what is it? The oh, was it old? It wasn't old the spice. old spice. It was yeah. the old spice yeah. guy, uh, or the internet equivalent, which was Dollar Shave Club. Yeah. Like, if you can tell a meaningful story in a short format that engages your audience online, I think people definitely buy into that. Yeah. Any other questions in the back? So this question is for both Mark and Joe. And your name is? I'm John. And your company is? Uh, Maven LA. Great. So do you have reactions to the Recode series about LA Tech last week? Reactions, reactions to the LA. Uh, no, I think it was it was interesting. To, it's just I think it's interesting that uh, they're covering LA, which I think is always good for everybody. And uh, we thought you know they did a pretty good job of just you know getting. I think they're just starting to learn all of the uh, uh, the different things that LA has to offer. And I think that's important for all of us here in LA yeah. to be able to get ourselves on the map and under and let people understand that it is we don't have to have the same exact tech makeup as uh, San, San Francisco or New York. But what LA is great at is there's a lot of great uh, you know, media, there's a lot of great um, you know, uh, other things that uh, are happening here. So uh, you know, I think getting it on the map is important. Uh, I would say two observations. One is the general profile of many of the companies in the history of LA was pretty damn good. And we haven't seen that many yeah. that have been that focused. Um, I won't hide that I was a bit disappointed about the Silicon Beach story. Uh, what I learned from that experience is, number one, try not to get in a fight with Kara on Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, good, that's good. And number two, honestly, she was right. She said to me on Twitter openly, you know, if you didn't want to be quoted in a story, you know, STFU. Yeah. And uh, it's true. I, look, I spent time with the journalist telling her why I didn't want to be in a story about Silicon Beach. Yeah and I should have just stopped. Yeah. And instead, I told her why I thought the term Silicon Beach existed and why it shouldn't exist, and I went on and on. It was my mistake, and I shouldn't have. And then I doubled down on it by voicing frustration on Twitter. <laughs> so you learned. It's a petulant, stupid yeah. response that I spend all my time telling CEOs not to do, yeah. and I did it. So the truth <laughs> is, I sent an apology email to the journalist and to Kara and just said, it was wrong of me. I, I shouldn't have talked, and frankly, I shouldn't have complained about it. Don't be a baby. Uh, <laughs> any, anyone else have questions before we wrap? Great. Well, listen, I want to say to you guys that two, two closing thoughts about Joe Perez. Number one, when I think about the great skills that exist for the next 10 to 15 years of the internet, not of LA, mm -hmm. Tastemade embodies those taking people who have creative storytelling skills and combining them with online marketing, understanding how to reach an audience that's fragmented across many different networks. There aren't many companies that have those skills, so I'm so excited to see what Tastemaze can do with that. Um, and also disappointed because Joe knows I wanted to be an investor in the company and I don't have sour grapes. I'm <laughs> on the sidelines rooting for you along with everybody else, but. I think it's so great that we have companies like yours in LA, and I just hope more of them will start. So thank you very much well, for sharing your wisdom today. Well, thank you, Mark. Today. Appreciate all your support. Thank you, sir. That was great. You're thank awesome. You.